Corbosha is uh, the greeting from my place. I'm not even sure he has gone through second reading, has he? So, for the first reading, you all know now. They just list it, so no debate. But in any case, I have heard uh, my colleague Lani Sukori speak about it. And I didn't even indicate any interest initially. But I got a call from South Africa. I was in the car one day. A lady that comes a lot to Nigeria called me from South Africa. You know, after all the pleasantries and all that, she talked about this amnesty bill. That is not just enough to present it to the people, it's good to do, to educate the people on it. And as she said, if need be, you travel to the countries that are already practicing them. And she said, Indonesia, maybe Malaysia, India, and some other countries, they have that bill in place. And she talked about the benefits. That is not to say people, where you steal money, you have, you cannot come back and say, okay, I've stolen so much. Well, you have kept some aside, and uh, I want to give back this. She's, she spoke to me on the need to, to, to get the people on board to understand what it's all about. Then before I listen to my colleague, uh, Lani Sokori, I think what I know the bill is about for my own little understanding is basically that some people now are outside the tax, tax net. They have stolen that money, nobody's problem them. But to have a free mind so they don't come back somebody to knock their door, they have come back to say, we have X, Y, Z assets in Luxembourg, in Monaco, in Dubai, or something. And I want to give it back to the government, or I want to pay tax on it and all. So you are not planning with these people. The few you know, you are going after them. But by telling these people come into that bracket, you make more money. So that's not to say if they come to say, I have taken or I have defrauded the country to the tune of one billion. You are just going to say, okay, fine. How much do you have left? I have a, I have a hundred thousand, I have a hundred million left. Okay, bring it and go. No, they will still check them out. But that somebody says, I am repentant. I am sorry that I did it, but I want to submit myself. But this is the whole history. You should listen to such people. If you can grant amnesty to militants that blow up your pipes that killed people you can grant amnesty to Boko Haram that say they don't believe in western education unprovoked they killed people maimed people so what about the looters they give the opportunity to say come forward and from what that lady told me billions can come into the country but we shouldn't see it in the light of somebody has stolen now you grant the person amnesty in the sense that the person brings back certain money and then you allow the person to go. Even the plea bargain. That's what plea bargain is all about. And it's practiced all over the world. You know? So, but for this, you get that extra money to fix your economy. But this is where we should actually focus our attention on. Create or strengthen the institutions that we have. When you strengthen the institutions, we will not trap all those losses. It means that people in the system today cannot plunder it like people did in the past. And then, because we have strengthened the institution, maybe some few can still go out, because no system is perfect. So it's not to say, leave the system porous, so whoever is there today will steal and come back some few years later to say, I'm returning this. Tighten the whole thing, the system. Make sure we are not incurring losses. People are not stealing this from the system anymore. But those that have stolen, let's collect. And if from that you can get four or five billion today, dollars into the economy, we'll be able to fund our budget. So I think that's the, the spirit behind it. Okay, okay so in uh, just when I came to this house in 2005, my first motion was on, on grazing bill, on ranching. Because at that time, if you're doing the campaigns, they were just headsmen were, were killing people, maiming people, and robbing people on Ewato, Ewo, Himu, Biaja Road was almost on a daily basis. We were going to Ewo for a meeting in our leader's house, Honorable Azigbemi. They attacked even the seven House of Assembly member then, Monday Fellow, and then um, and, um, Ilwabi, Patrick Ilwabi. 
they attacked them with stick and everything gone. So I think they killed one of them. This policeman with them killed one of them. So they were going back. So they saw my convoy and I said, okay, let's go. So we went through, we didn't see them anymore. So all that was happening before I got here. So like I said, my first motion was on that, that you should ranch is a business. You cannot just come and walk into another person's farm. We don't do it in our place. I cannot leave Uboha, where I'm from. And I will just go to Uzea, which is even next door. Take one place, clear it, and say it's not my farm. It would just, it would, nobody will allow that. Or even leave Edo State, come to Abuja, that's federal capital territory, and just take one piece of land and start clearing it and say, this is not my farm. It's not allowed. So why should somebody take cow, I mean cows, into somebody's farm? They will eat it, occupy the land, and then move ahead. Because it's a business, you will sell those cows and make money from it. So how you feed them should not be my headache. You should buy grass to feed them. Quarantine them, put them in the place. That's what happens all over the world. I used to go to Dallas Fort Worth a lot, and they call it... Um, cattle country. But you don't see cows. You don't see cattle on the street. They are all in ranches. Uh, George Bush Jr. They own uh, Crawford, uh, Crawford Ranch in Houston. Those days when you go for oil and gas events, it's part of the place people go and visit. He was there before he went to the White House. When he finished in the White House, he bought another ranch in Dallas Fort Worth. Same Texas. And if you go there, you will see cattle and all that moving about. It's a private business. So that's what we are seeing today. If you must rear your cattle, go meet the kings, meet the community to say, I need a piece of land or I need, uh, I need land to do my business. If they give that land to you, secure it and leave your cattle there. Simple. So like, but my own bill, my own motion was shut down because they said my prayers were similar to someone else's prayers that they defeated. I should go and repackage it, which I did. I did that almost immediately, but it today has not been taken since 2005. You know, so it's a bony issue, not just in the two state alone, but all over the country. Most times when such motions come, they are talking about increased security. Yeah, it's good. But how many policemen do we have in this country? From the days of MD Abu Bakr, we have been saying we have 350,000 policemen. And yet we say how many, we have lost a whole lot of them. Others have retired. So, in actual fact, how many do we really have? When was the last time we recruited? I think we just finished an exercise and they were trying to get 10,000 in. So we do not have enough policemen to even police the country or even military men. So the thing to do is to do the sensible thing, if you must. Rear your cattle, go get a ranch. And... Well, if I, if I take this, if I stretch this a little bit, I'll go into the CONFAB report. In the CONFAB report, the part of the recommendation was those states in the north that are predominantly into livestock, you can do grazing. But the ones that are not, you do ranching. That's part of the recommendation. And as we are saying today, just send the CONFAB report to the National Assembly. Let us debate it and then, you know, the ones we accept will make them part of the laws of the land. So it's a bony issue, but the simple way to do it is, is a business, get a ranch, put your cattle there, and pay tax to the government. That's all. Honorable, it feels you. Like they say in Wari, at all, at all, now be winch. <laughs> if you can get piecemeal, if that is what we can get now, let's take the piecemeal. But the best option would have been bring the confab report. Let's look at everything in there. And then debate it. That's its beauty in democracy, you know, or in parliamentary system of government. You debate it on the floor of the house. You take it to the Senate and debate it. And then we will now collectively agree when it will pass. And then it becomes a law. We spend billions in the confirm. So why is it gathering dust somewhere in the villa? We should debate it. There are so many good things they said there that we can, we can put to work today. My, my constituents. By me. Yes. Okay, well, when I got in here, 
uh, my predecessor, that was 2015, had construction of a um, block of classroom and furniture. Then they were told that there was no money, that the money, whatever was in the budget, would not be enough to do all that. But I aggressively pursued it and I delivered on all of them. Even my predecessor had given up that, okay, we can just get one there. But I pursued it and we got all. But 2016 budget, as you all know, was really budget we made the input in. And again, that again was, um, that was so much about padding and all. So, so many things were envisaged, we'll go into the budget, did not go in. But I will speak on my intervention fund, which popularly known as constituency project, was agriculture. Before, when I was campaigning, I had town hall meetings in both local government that I represent. Uromi, I had a town hall meeting in Sabema Hotel, and I gathered so many young people, not even knowing that PDP will not win the presidency, will not have the villa. I said, look, government cannot do it all alone. So the way forward is entrepreneurship. So do business, lend a trade, and also they don't depend on government. You know? So that's on record. I have a record. We recorded all that. Then I went to Obiada, we met in the Hotel de Home, young people too. I spoke with them on all that. The future is maybe agriculture, entrepreneurship, learn the trade, learn something to do. And I gave them examples of the rich people that I used to know in Esa land, the Ilo Bays, the Tulas, the Ikbeas, you know? They were traders, maybe not even educated. They are still rich today. They have assets everywhere. But behold, after the election, we got here and uh, PDP was not in during the presidential election. But it, that hasn't changed. So I came with that mentality. So in my budget, I put agriculture there. So today, we have cleared 100 hectares of land. Maybe someday, we arrange for people to come and visit. So we have cleared, the projection was to clear 200 hectares. But what was actually approved, what the money in the budget could cover was 56, 56 hectares of land. But Today, as I speak to, we have done 100 hectares. We have tractors on site. We have planters there. And by the grace of God, by the time we are harvesting, I would have purchased harvesters. 100% mechanized. Then I have 100 youths we have selected. The idea was to give them one hectare each. But now, because of the constraint of not being able to do 200 hectares, we are doing 100 hectares, we give them an acre each. Whatever comes from there is their own. So that's my own way of creating employment for them. Because when you tell them, farm, they don't, they are not inspired. That their forefathers did that, and they are poor in the village. And they are telling them to go to farm, they are not interested. Because during the town hall meeting, somebody in Nubia just asked me, one young man, he told me that all this one you are just saying, bros, we respect you, all this one you are saying, we, don't, we are not flowing with you. And they clapped, I was, I was, my heart was broken. It means all this grammar I'll be speaking, you are not following me. You guys say if it's police job or customs, uh -huh, they want to work, not I'm telling them farm. And I said to the guy, if there is slots for police or custom, do you think it will come to you? I just I'm giving you this advice. So again, like I said, I, we got about 100 young people. We are, they are, there's a training on Monday, and there's another training again Friday next week. You know, train them on mechanized farming. But I don't think there's a whole lot they are going to do with their hands. Anyway, we have, everything's going to be mechanized. So it's my own way of engaging those, uh, those uh, 200 young people. It's 200, not 100, 200. It's my way of engaging those 200 young people. And by the grace of God, 2017 will still be expansion of that farm. You know, I already have off takeout. Yes, we are doing maize now. Maybe when we harvest this, we're planning to harvest twice. But again, you know the thing with government. That's why at, at times I think they are paying lip service to this whole thing. My constituency project is agriculture. Farming season, the money didn't come out. You know, so it came out late, and then that's how we are. That's why we are where we are now. So we are just planting now. Maybe we are going to be talking about harvest in three months' time. But because the season will be dry, then we can quickly plant uh, cassava. Uh, so by the time that we are harvesting that, we will not plant maize again. So that's the plan. Good enough, somebody, when I discussed with somebody in Canada, they said to me, I am interested. I'm going to bring silos. I will build silos in farm where you can store the maize 
and sell you have seasonal maize when it's cheap you can store it and plant as much as you want to plant and we have people to offtake them maize cassava we have offtakers so the thing to do is to drive this into the consciousness of these young people that there's money in agriculture but thereafter if you can give me one hectare of land two hectares of land i will go there with buddhism clear it for you prepare the land for you and give you seedlings so i start you off as as a, a, a agriculturist you know so that's the plan set up because from my constituency people go to libya a lot and most of them are dying on the high sea so it's a way of keeping them when you tell parents don't send your children to Libya. Don't support them to go to Libya. They are not happy. But have you created an alternative that will keep them here? No. So I want to create that. We have been working with an NGO. I think they, they, something about returnees and all. They came to me. We gave them some slots for those that return from Libya. So my prayer is that I can extend this farm and engage as many of them. And then in actual fact, I will practice it. It's just in name. If today we say, okay, fine allow the federated states to pay, to be on their own and then pay something to the center. This country would be much, much better than it is today. Now, I have said this severally. If we didn't need to get up, get, leave our houses today, we didn't need to leave our houses today, but you have money and you have food, will you? Do you think this battle has actually